Hi everyone, welcome to another Healthy New Zealand podcast and today's very special guest is Belinda, Belinda Fete. And the reason I wanted to talk to Belinda is because of the tremendous amount of work that she's done in understanding the best interests behind the plant-based movement. And that's exploding in New Zealand and throughout Australia. So I've been sharing a lot of Belinda's posts and YouTube clips with you over the years. And we'll link to those in the show notes, but it's fantastic to talk to her in, per in person. So thanks for coming, Belinda. I know you fitted this into a very, very busy schedule. So I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me, Susan. Um, I'd like to start just by you telling us a little bit about your story, um, the story of you and Gary and how you ended up in this place of becoming, um, revealing all this background to the plant-based advocacy. Can I just say, we never expected this and certainly didn't take this on thinking it would become anything big. Um, a little bit of the backstory is, my husband was diagnosed with cancer at the age of 38 and we'd been together since I was 16 and he was 18 and I'd not made an adult decision without him. So when he was diagnosed with cancer at 38 and taken to intensive care, had surgery and I was told they weren't even sure if he would come out of that surgery, all things that went through my head was, oh my gosh, I, I, I can't imagine what this life's going to be like. We had three young children. Gary had to learn to walk again. He had radiotherapy, a stereotactic radiotherapy for three months and then went on to chemotherapy. And while I'm not questioning what happened and the treatment because the cancer was found late, it was a very aggressive pituitary tumour, I am questioning in hindsight why diet wasn't considered as an adjunct to all that therapy. But we had no idea back then. So when Gary was in hospital, he was so thirsty post-op and they recommended he have juice because it's much more palatable than water. So he was my husband feeding potentially a cancer in hindsight with just so much sugar. I mean, it's, it's frightening to think of in retrospect. So we went through that. 2004, he couldn't control the growth of the cancer, so he had more surgery. And by 2009, they just said, we're really, really sorry. We just don't know what else we can do. And he was, as you can imagine, for the last couple of years, he'd been scanning the internet, trying to find solutions and people who were up to date with certainly some way that you could control cancer. And interestingly, he was given David Gillespie's Sweet Poison book, talking about sugar and health. Okay, not specifically cancer, but sugar. And, and in that almost the same week, our um, chemist, local chemist said to Gary, there's some really interesting information coming about, out about people who are on a trial for metformin, which is a drug that's used for type two diabetes. And these people seem to be getting either less incidence of cancer or their cancer is going into remission. That's an unexpected side effect, side effect of metformin. So would you consider going on to metformin? So Gary's reading Sweet Poison, being told this information, thought, what does metformin do? So in very lay terms, it pushes the sugar out of the bloodstream into the tissues. So it gets it out of the bloodstream. Gary's saying, I'm already on so many medications, medications, chemo, side effects of chemo, blood pressure, um, gastroparesis it just it's just growing his conditions and his sickness so he said why don't I just take sugar out of the equation that sounds like a logical thing to do not take more medication just take sugar out unfortunately it took a couple of months to actually remember biochemistry and that's what we've got to start to think about nutrition science is biochemistry inside the body not nutrition science outside the body so um, starchy carbohydrates become glucose the minute you ingest them and it was his light bulb moment to not only reduce sugar but process carbohydrates out of his diet 
after a year of going for him specifically with his cancer and wanting to control it, he went very low carb keto and he was supervised to actually be able to come off his chemotherapy. And he's been in remission for seven years. So for us, low carb keto have been you know, the greatest miracle we could possibly have hoped for. He's still got his cancer, but it's in remission and it's given him a life without chemo for seven years. It's improved his health. Like all health matters, he's down to just one tablet a day because he needs that steroid. He can't make it himself. The pituitary tumor has been fired by everything that could possibly happen to it. So, But he's off every other medication. And so he's the healthiest version of himself that he can be right now. And so I encourage right. your listeners to think, you know, it's about taking back control of your own health. And if you can do that using food as medicine, why would you not? Oh, so thanks so much for sharing that. It's interesting because I um, talked to my friend Al Dendenberg a few weeks ago and, you know, he, sh he shared, you know, a very similar journey and he's used the carnival diet to basically halt the progression of his cancer and you know it's very interesting and you know simple for people to do as you say you can stop taking all these medications with simple but hard Susan yeah, yeah. because sugar is so addictive mm -hmm. and, and it's everywhere like it's just marketed to us it's a it's a drug that we can have from birth pretty much you know these things are around juices they get put into babies bottles um you know, all of these things it's it's a socially acceptable drug and it's very hard for some people to give up. Gary, you went cold turkey. I don't know about you. It took me a year to get rid of sugar out of my tea. I dropped lots of other things, but all that tea, I really love my tea with sugar. Again, it's where people are in their journey and it's how important this is to change their diet for their health, depending on how quickly it needs to be done. But I would think for anyone over 40, anyone of our generation, 50, but anyone of our generation really needs to consider because we have been the first generation to be doused with sugar, polyunsaturated oils and processed carbs. And our bodies are going to start to feel the impact of that. So the sooner we can drop those things out of our diet, the healthier we can become. So going forward. Point out for the listeners that Gary is an orthopedic surgeon as well. So that's a very important part of the story. But carry yes. on. So now I'm about to say, my husband saw the health benefits in himself. And as an orthopedic surgeon of 20 years, he was sick of band-aiding sick care. It was just like type 2 diabetes in his practice was coming like a tsunami. 20 years ago, he might have seen someone with um, needing debriding of their ulcerating um, complications of type 2 diabetes once or twice a year. In 2013, 2014, he was seeing someone every single week in northern Tasmania. We've only got a catchment area of 120,000 people. Every single week he was seeing someone that needed some sort of debridement being done, and sometimes that was amputation, lower limb amputation. And he just went, but he didn't have time to think until he improved his own health. And then he thought, if this is helping me and blood glucose and all of those sort of things, he started doing a lot of research, contacting people around the world, getting in touch with Rod Taylor and starting um, low carb down under. But they were going, this has to help people with type 2 diabetes. Mm. So he started being a public health advocate. It actually started in 2011, 2012. He started talking to the hospital. He, started, he approached the dietitians and said, you know, I'm reading more and more about this. I've had my own experience with this. Do you think maybe? Well, no, no, you don't think maybe. He started talking to our community. We'd start some, you know, we actually have little conferences, mini conferences for health professionals and for the public. And then we, then, my daughter and I encouraged Gary to get on social media. Thought, this is the perfect platform for your message. <laughs> oh dear, we threw him under a bus, unfortunately. As soon as he started that social media as well, obviously he became a threat beyond our small community. 
So as an orthopedic surgeon who had studied biochemistry, physiology, anatomy, all of those things, he was reported to the medical board in 2014 by a dietitian at the hospital he was working at for recommending someone reduce sugar with type 2 diabetes complications. The actual report was someone reducing sugar. And we went, what? So, oh, for sure. The medical board's going to just toss this out. This is vexatious. This is stupid. This makes no sense. Oh, no. They subjected him to a two and a half year star chamber investigation, determining whether an orthopedic surgeon who's allowed to tell someone who is smoking that they should give up cigarettes without being a respiratory physician, who's allowed to tell someone they should exercise mental health, physical health, without having any qualifications in that specialty, but tell someone to reduce sugar, far out. We had the roof come in on us. And I looked at my husband. So in 2014, he was actually from all the medications, from his past, from his bad diet growing up, he required a hip replacement in 2014. That exact same week, he was reported to the board. So I'm watching my husband. I actually wrote a blog post at the time saying, don't shoot the messenger. Here's my husband just wanting to do good in the community, just wanting to make a difference. And he's being targeted. In hindsight, after we were finally able to get access to an 845 page document that the medical director at the Launceston General Hospital where Gary was working supplied to APRA. Inside that, we didn't get that until 2018. In 2014, this document included two letters from the CEO of the then CEO of the Dietitians Association of Australia, writing to the CEO of the LGH asking for them to silence Gary. So Gary was stepping on the toes of the peak body for nutrition. And interestingly, dietetics, and I don't know what it's like in New Zealand, but here in Australia, dietetics doesn't come under the APRA medical board or the APRA um, health regulation. We've got doctors, dentists, nurses, everybody else, like 15 different groups under this umbrella, including occupational health, but dietetics isn't under it. So APRA was investigating Gary for something that was outside their scope of practice. And if you look at all the sponsors and the partners of the Dietitians Association of Australia, wow, they are self-regulating, self-accrediting, and they provide education to dietitians, continuing education. We had no idea in 2014 when I got my back up, when I went, whoa, why are you coming after my husband? that the Dietitians Association of Australia were in a partnership, in a corporate partnership with the Australian Breakfast Cereal Manufacturing Forum, hashtag cereal for brekkie. They were in this partnership where it was outlined that the Dietitians Association of Australia, which has since changed their name to Dietitians Australia, to use their members. So think about that. Dietitians had no idea. Their accrediting regulatory body were to use them to influence, protect, and actively defend cereal and grains messaging, even sugar. Gary was named as a specific target for active defense in these documents that I uncovered in 2016. Now, this has got nothing to do with biochemistry or nutrition science. This is vested interests wanting to shut down low carb, why? because cereal sales were down. Unbelievable. It's, it is absolutely unbelievable. It is. And, you know, we have the sanitarium here, as you do in Australia, and I'll get you to speak to that a little bit and about the yep. um, interests behind that. But we have such a huge plant-based advocacy here, and we are so anti-red meat. And exactly as you say, Belinda, it's got nothing to do with the biochemistry. When you talk biochemistry with people and they, they just dismiss it and they just say, well, take a supplement. <laughs> I know, I know. So biochemistry 
So I would say nutrition science outside the body is influenced by cultural reasons. It's influenced for ethical beliefs, influenced for religious ideology, which I will come to, and very much influenced by, by vested interests for profit. And I say, when Gary was reported in 2014, I just thought we had no idea that the dietary guidelines were actually promoting vegetarian, if not vegan diets. And I started to say to Gary, I said, do you realise that there's hardly any meat in our dietary guidelines anymore? And he went, oh, don't be silly. No, I'm serious. And do you realise this? And he just went, no, it couldn't be. Anyway, the expert witness, one expert witness, was used throughout the two and a half year investigation by Gary. So my, my senses just thought there's something wrong here. The APRA Medical Board of Tasmania, again, tiny, we're down the bottom of the world. We're even further down than New Zealand. <laughs> we're right, tucked down there. They used the biggest gun in Southeast Asia Pacific to determine if an orthopedic surgeon could talk about sugar and carbohydrates in the diet. This man, I thought, he must work for the sugar industry. Why else would someone who is, has attained such a high position in nutrition, worldwide really, come in as the expert witness for an orthopedic surgeon in Tasmania? So I started to investigate him and I was totally surprised. This is before we found all those serial documents and everything else. Totally surprised to find this guy was working for sanitarium in Sydney. And he was actually on their expert advisory panel for the entire time he was the expert witness for Gary. And maybe like you, in the back of my mind, I knew sanitarium was owned by a church, but it, it wasn't, I don't know. Sanitarium in Australia has a tiny footprint, tiny. We've only got one, well, we've now got two big health food industries, um, sanitarium and life health foods, they own both. But the church have one major hospital in Australia, just one in Sydney. We've got one major publishing printing press area. You know, they own one university college, a few school, yeah, definitely schools and different things, but it's, it's a small footprint. When you consider in America, they own 26 hospitals in Florida alone. Mm. So we have a very small footprint in Australia and I imagine, except that they promote health food and a lot of people buy it. So I just, I started to think, well, you know, what's this about the church? And I started doing more and more research. And before I go further, and I'm sure you 100% agree, that this is not about challenging individuals' beliefs. It's not about me deciding if someone can be a vegetarian or a vegan. This is purely about what my research has uncovered vested interests and this religious ideology shaping our dietary and health guidelines and regulating or partnering with associations who protect their message and then regulating my husband for speaking about the health benefits of reducing carbohydrates and including animal proteins and fats in the diet for those who choose to do it. Like this is, this is about choice, their choice, my choice, our choice. Um, so just, I really want to put that forward. And in my research, and what I'm challenging is the commercial arm of the church. So it's not about what people do as an individual. This is a commercial arm that partners with the Heart Association, that partners with the Dietitians Association, that, that dictates that my husband is going to be silenced because cereal sales are down. Mm. Yep. No, I think that's a very important message and I agree with you 100%. I'm not anti-religion. I'm not anti-eating plants at all. I just want it to be truthful and honest. I want the biochemistry to be truthful and honest. And, you know, we didn't evolve into humans by eating a plant-based diet. If we had, we would not require vitamin B12 as an essential nutrient because there's no vitamin b12 in plants so we couldn't possibly have evolved 
eating a diet that didn't supply an essential yeah. nutrient. And there are many other nutrients as well. So I don't really mind people eating plants, but don't say this is what we evolved on. This is the most healthy diet. Mm -hmm. You know, just enjoy, just enjoy it and make your own choices and make sure you supplement yes. is my little addition. So we have this lifestyle medicine, Garden of Eden, lifestyle medicine education. We've got all this backdrop to this and in New Zealand you know um, lifestyle medicine is pretty huge Garden of Eden is over here um, I think doctors got, for nutrition as well be wary of them <laughs> uh, the exercise medicine. exercise is medicine yeah. I think this is where I went even further once I uncovered poor old Professor Mark Walkers who is highly esteemed in nutrition what I came to realize was he wasn't just working for Sanctuary Sanitarium, this health and wellness um, village pretty much that was opened in Sydney based on the founder of the Adventist church's beliefs and taking it back. So most of my research has gone way back in history, way back before 1970, 77, when supposedly the saturated fat was demonised and everything else. I've gone right back to the 1800s. And... When this church, when the Seventh-day Adventist church was formed, Ellen G. White was given a vision the exact same year, 1863, told, she was told by God that fruit, nuts and seeds were the God-appointed diet for man. They don't believe that they're young earth creationists, so there is no evolution. So when you consider that, there was, there is no role for hunter gathering. There is no evolution. There is no role for animal proteins and bats in our diet. When they consider that we began life in the Garden of Eden and that was what was available to Adam and Eve. So she was told that flesh eating was stirring baser passions and animal instincts. She was told by God that eating flesh led to the most heinous sin of all time at that time, self-vice, which was the Puritan term for masturbation. She believed that eating animal proteins and fats, she was told by God that eating animal proteins and fats caused moral and spiritual and physical pollution. So if you understand this woman I mean, most of us, I had never even heard of her, but she wrote over 5,000 periodicals, 49 textbooks. She wrote like a massive amount of things. She's the most prolific author of either gender that has been transcribed into another language. Without understanding her message and her importance in this whole space, you, you can't understand the anti-meat messaging that's come about. John Harvey Kellogg was a devout Seventh-day Adventist. He grew up in a Seventh-day Adventist home. And everyone's heard of Kellogg's cornflakes, and you might not be aware, but Kellogg's cornflakes were actually developed, were they created, were invented to stop people masturbating. That, that was his idea to provide a bland diet. And so he was 12 when he first started working for Ellen G. White and her husband. And as a 12-year-old, he was typesetting her books, her sermons, her periodicals, and they were powerful. The, the terminology that she used about masturbating was incredible. And he types it at the age of 12, a solemn appeal to mothers, her book. And in it, she said every single terrible thing that could happen of children and young people violating nature's laws, eating meat masturbating it was it was just incredible and she said it was as if they put a pistol to their chest and shot themselves dead mm. and he was 12 so imagine typesetting these things for four years and then being paid to go and educate yourself as a doctor because they'd already founded their western health reform institute they wanted to heal people so john harvey Keller was paid by the church to go and learn to do medicine he came back as a doctor in 1976, he started that 
he was the director and superintendent of the hospital. Under his tutelage was a woman named Lena Cooper. And she founded the American Dietetics Association. In 1917, she founded that on the belief that fruits, grains, nuts and seeds were the God-appointed diet for man. Not only did she found that, but she wrote textbooks. She trained 500 dietitians under her tutelage from the Battle Creek Sanitarium. It's, it's phenomenal how influential they've been. And to, I mean, I, you have to read my blogs because I could go on forever and talk about a lot of things. But to put it into context right now, the US 2020 Dietary Guideline Committee include a man called Joan Sabat, who is the head of nutrition at Loma Linda University in America, owned by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Very powerful man. He's on the Dietary Guidelines Committee, not only determining what we eat, but the saturated caps, the saturated fat cap. Mm. There's four people on this committee, subcommittee, and they are deciding whether we should lower our saturated fat cap to 7% or even zero. And in my mind, no one with an ideological bias should be making that decision for us. And the other three people have all got ties to the food industry or a belief for 40 years that no saturated fat should be in our diet. And I can't quite work out why she has this belief. But we're talking about, you know, an incredible influence. This man, Joan Sabat, wrote The Global Influence of the Seventh-day Adventist Church on Diet in 2018 in response to the very first time Gary spoke about my research. So I've been researching since 2014. We didn't, sorry, it's been earlier, 17. We didn't speak about it till 2016 because it's a really difficult topic to broach. And some people here might be going, this is an uncomfortable conversation, talking about a church, talking about religion, possibly influencing our dietary guidelines. And it wasn't for two years until I finally had enough information that I could say to Gary, I just don't know. I don't know what to do with it. And he said to me, now, two years later, I'm seeing two or three people every week with complications of diabetes being told to eat a high carb, low fat diet. Yeah. We have to speak out about this. And it he was still under investigation. He wasn't allowed to talk. And so I mentioned, I started my website, I Support Gary. And thank goodness for so much support from people in the online space who came to share our story and to interview us. And so we were able to get the message out. After four and a half years, Gary was fully exonerated when his case was sent to a different state. In four weeks, they threw the entire thing out because it was, it was vexatious and bullying and mobbing and it was ridiculous. But you've got to understand, this man wrote the global influence of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. They are proud of what they're doing. This is their commission. Their commission is to, well, Ellen G. White, when she came to Australia to set up sanitarium, the health food business is to supply the people with food which will take the place of meat, milk and eggs. This is their commission. And I would suggest from things that I've read that Jesus Christ won't come back. They're waiting for the second coming. He will not come back until enough people have given up these things so this is a, a purpose like it's far bigger than any financial incentive this is salvation yeah. so when you consider it on that level it's amazing and and I think you mentioned lifestyle medicine well in my research lifestyle medicine the American College of Lifestyle Medicine was founded on the campus of Loma Linda University in 2003 by devout Seventh-day Adventists for up until 2010, I would say the majority of their people in that association were Adventists or very, very much aligned to that message. Um, there were some very prominent vegans in America who may not have been an Adventist, but they believed in that message too and appear to be part of that group. But in 2010, something really strange to me happened because 
the Adventist Church are also very anti-sugar. So Ellen G. White, tea, coffee, sugar, meat, you know, alcohol, that was stimulants that she was anti. And so she did say, and in her defence, she also believed that we should be sleeping and we should be exercising and we should be doing all these other things. So she had a, a very holistic approach to lifestyle, except that she was so anti-meat, which didn't make sense if you consider biochemistry. And so in this movement, the American College of Lifestyle Medicine was based on her health principles. It was based on her beliefs and plant biased, I call it, plant based, plant biased, whatever you want to say. So in 2010, for some bizarre reason, Coca Cola has gotten involved in lifestyle medicine. Two key people in the Coca Cola movement, global um, movement, exercises, medicine, they've come in to be board members of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine and taken it from a fairly smallish growing group to something that could sit on the world stage. Since 2010, they've integrated this symbiotic relationship, which doesn't make any sense, except that they both want to demonize saturated animal fats and produce a, or just a health halo over um, carbohydrates and well, we'll let sugars go because it's more important to demonize saturated fat than animal proteins. So this group have grown massively. They're now running exams in 20 different countries around the world, including Australia and New Zealand. While my research may show that the Australian Lifestyle Medicine Association, which has become the Australasian Society of Lifestyle Medicine, including New Zealand and Australia, may not have founded on Adventist church principles as the main one, but that global lifestyle medicine movement of which the Australasian Society of Lifestyle Medicine is now a sister organization is very much based on the Adventist principles it started out with and aligned with Coca-Cola's exercises medicine. And isn't the, people sorry and it's like isn't the American College of Preventive Medicine is that I think that and the American medical practitioners Just the key people who've been part of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine have conveniently sat in other colleges that have passed and allowed the American College of Lifestyle Medicine to become an accepted group. They have, you know, the 15 physician core competencies and everything else. Adventists, Seventh-day Adventists were sitting in these other colleges that allowed for these things to occur. It's complicated, but... Um, but they're not actually Seventh Day Adventist, I don't believe. Not. But there's key people in those but areas that have allowed the American College of Lifestyle Medicine to become what it has. Yeah, because then all our GPs and medical doctors and and are inadvertently trained, believing that this is evidence based practice, and then the public, we all trust our doctors, and we think, well, they should know the science. And so then we have this real problem. But anyway, carry on with what you were saying. I didn't mean to interrupt. <laughs> no. Well, well, right now, as you said, right now, lifestyle medicine, the global lifestyle medicine movement, and, it, and they come under the Seventh-day Adventist beliefs and the Coca-Cola beliefs, have joined together to create this group called LMED, the Lifestyle Medicine Education Collaborative. Every single person who's writing the exams, who's involved in writing the curriculums, who's involved in accrediting people, whatever else, they are tied to the Adventist church, tied to Coca-Cola, or believe that animal proteins and fats are a heinous sin for whatever reason. Uh, it should not be in our diet. And they're creating this medical education that's now being trialled in at least eight universities in America. Uh, I think it's being adopted into eight universities and being trialled in so many more. It, it, it's along the lines of the Eat Lancet planetary health diet. You know, you have a tiny bit of meat 
as a garnish occasionally. You know, get rid of meat, uh, get rid of milk, get rid of cheese, get rid of dairy, get rid of eggs. Like it's it's scary. We've watched medical doctors being indoctrinated, being trained, and I would say by vested interests who wanted to get rid of saturated fat and ideology from the 70s, you know, fear fat. What is going to happen to our next generation of medical education if this LMED, which they're fighting for it to get into Australia right now, if this LMED becomes part of our medical curricula curriculum here in Australia and New Zealand, where our doctors don't just fear saturated fat, but now they fear animal proteins as well. And they're getting all this messaging in everywhere that animal proteins, animal fats, like cows are calling, causing this global warming and methane and, and we should be choosing to, it doesn't matter about our health, we should be choosing it for our planet when it doesn't make any sense and it's it's so biased. Um, you, you go, we're going to be in so much trouble. If we, if our doctors are being taught this, my research has uncovered the most bizarre things. Like the sugar industry were telling the dietitians and the Diabetes Australia that sugar's okay. They actually wrote the diabetes manual in, I don't know, 1990s. We've, we've got a copy of it. The sugar industry are part of it. The RACGP here, their 2016 to 2018 diabetes guide, you know, a couple of hundred page document, little booklet that they were given. On the back it says AstraZeneca and Sanofi have you know, sponsored this. No wonder in the diabetes guidelines for our GPs, the first 130 pages talks about, I think it mentions lifestyle fluffily in the first you know, quarter of a paragraph or something, first paragraph, but then 130 pages of how to medicate how to control mm. blood sugar because that's what they're taught and it's it's such an unfair situ, um, system because that teaching becomes their regulation yes if doctors challenge it if dietitians challenge their education and their education is regulated you know, it, it makes it really really hard so brave people like you like gary like tim notes Low carb down under, all these groups of people that are speaking out more and more are risking their medical licenses, their registrations, and not only that, but an incredible smear campaign. You look at what the tobacco industry did to try and minimize the harm, you know, when they said tobacco is not bad, it's not bad. You know, people were had their lives ruined by the suggestion that they were just calling out and conspiracy theorists and whatever else. And what I've come to realise is how powerful these groups are that they can attempt, or they actually did. Gary became the only medical doctor in the world who was silenced from talking about nutrition mm. for four and a half years. It's only that we just refused and we just yeah. had the ability to use social media to just keep being loud and, and, and point out how ridiculous the whole thing was. And it's great that we do have this huge co community now. I mean, I started looking into this, you know, into the, the carbs and the fats and the proteins back in about 1998. And, mm. you know, it was back, we didn't, I didn't have the internet to sort of download stuff. It was all ordering it from the university and reading papers. Yeah. Um, and so I've been on, on, on it for a long time. And even in just my tiny little world, you know, the condemnation and the criticism mm -hmm. and I'm a witch doctor and I'm crazy, but it's exploded in the last few years and now social Absolutely. media is. And, and the great thing is we have such good quality people out there like Gary, like Professor Noakes, you know, um, like Greg Shea from, you know, um, the US. I mean, it's just full of these really high quality people now pulling the lid off the whole the whole process and um all of your um listeners they can all access gary's all his talks are online for free i mean that's been a very important thing for us as well um is to provide access to people can access those tools 
but if they're not told about them <laughs> through you know, groups like you, through people like you and, and further beyond, so many people still have got no idea that type 2 diabetes is not a chronic progressive disease because Diabetes Australia pretty much insinuates that it is. And two years ago, they stated it was. Um, and, that, and that's what we get here. And I do a bit of work with some of the local diabetes community groups and it's really hard to break through that mindset yeah. that chronic, progressive medications need to increase. Yeah. And it's really hard to break through the mindset that they need to eat small, regular, carbohydrate-based meals throughout the day and then just mm -hmm. take more insulin to deal with the rising blood sugar. I mean, it's just, it's insane. And like you said, it just keeps coming back to biochemistry every time. Gary had a patient in, I think, 2018 that he saw in his clinic, a guy in his 40s who was already getting complications in his eyes, his kidneys, his feet, peripheral neuropathies. He said, have you heard about this? So this is in the public hospital clinic. He said, I'm, I'm officially not allowed to talk about this, but I'm telling you because you're too young to be getting these complications. And he took on board what Gary was talking about and a couple of weeks later came back, said, no, I'm starting to feel better in myself, I'm starting to feel clearer in my head. Um, someone who potentially had been considered difficult, you know, missing work, doing all sorts of things. It was hard to concentrate. Suddenly he was getting mental clarity that he just hadn't had before. And then another couple of weeks later, he had the beginning of ulcerations on his toes. It was healing. Mm. It was honestly healing. So he went back to the clinic, the diabetes clinic downstairs, and they said, do not follow Gary's advice. It will kill you. Mm. And he turned to these people and said, well, you've been killing me for the last 10 years. I want to listen to someone else for change. Mm. And that's the thing. They believed because of their education, because of their accreditation and their regulation and the messaging that keeps coming from associations and whatever else, that Gary's advice about low carb, this is back, you know, this is years ago, would kill well, hopefully in our community now, <laughs> there'd be very few people who could come out with a statement like that and someone not go, oh, yeah, right, you don't know what you're talking about. And that's the benefit, and I imagine, for you too. Like We have an opportunity in our small communities to make a much bigger difference yes. um, than in America where 26 hospitals in Florida alone are owned by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Um, you know, well, I can't even imagine it. New Zealand's a small country and I think that if we can get this message out to the people of New Zealand and we can really start to make some change in how people choose their food, I think we can really reverse a lot of this process. Our, the diabetes in our children is just escalating at humongous rates and the first case we had of diabetes in an under 15 year old was in 1994. And it's increasing at three to five percent per annum. It's just it just makes me want to cry, you know. I am um, just really passionate about the fact that we we are going to have to do something about this. I think we need to really look specifically. I mean, in my mind and from my research, the commercial arm of the Adventist Church Sanitarium, in particular, and Coca Cola's exercise and medicine appear to be the two major driving factors of information to doctors and dietitians about where our health should come from. And Coca-Cola is using exercise as medicine as, a, as the solution to obesity. You know, the combination of the two of them, sanitarium and Coca-Cola together, this idea for the medical education is for people to write prescriptions, for people to move more, eat less, meat like that's honestly what it is it's not just eat less eat less meat and drink, don't forget to drink your coke and yeah but a little bit of coke's okay as long as you do lots of exercise you know you can you can run that off don't worry about that and i have i was just blown away by the fact that sanitarium 
health food company, we've all fallen for it. We've all believed, we've all been health washed. And maybe because they're owned by a church in the back of our minds, they're making you know, wheat bix and making good things. Up and go is probably terrible. It's a chemical, what not of whatever, apparently made so that they're meeting people where they're at and they can take them to where they want to go. But Sanitarium owns or has under its umbrella this group called Life Health Foods. And they make alternative meats, soy, all sorts of other things as well. So it's Sanitarium really sticks pretty much to soy milk and cereal. But you've got this whole other layer. And when you go to their websites, when you go to the alternative meat company website, that's all the same propaganda you see from the vegan movement, like cows are bad, this is bad. Well, Sanitarium would never do that on their website. But on their other ones, they are very active. They're vegan activists on some of their other websites. But I had no idea that Sanitarium actually managed to get their um, fact sheets, their health fact sheets, into pretty much every single general practitioner's um, software on their computers. So our GP, because we believe that Sanitarium is health, They'd push a button on their computer for someone who had type 2 diabetes and that would print this beautifully trademarked sanitarium fact sheet for the person to take home to eat fruits, grain, nuts and seeds, minimal lean, make sure it's lean meat, if at all. Our doctors have been providing people with fact sheets for 20 years. The church, not only sanitarium, but the Adventist church in America, paid for a supplement to go into our Royal Australasian College of GPs magazine, a supplement to go into it telling GPs that eating a vegetarian eating vegetarian was perfectly safe. Our Dietitians Association of Australia, when you looked at their vegetarian position paper, they've since taken it down of course, can't access it all, but I've got it. Every single reference was from the Seventh-day Adventist Church or people who are devout Adventists or Kellogg's, mm. which while it started out, both John Harvey Kellogg and his brother William Keith were both devout Adventists. By the time the Kellogg's cornflake empire began, um, William Keith was no longer a devout Adventist, I don't believe, but certainly the church never owned it. The church didn't own Kellogg's. The church owned Sanitarium. Ellen G. White came to Australia to set up the church, the hospital, the printing press, the schools, the university, and this time a food industry that the church owned and they would get all the profits. Mm. In Australia and New Zealand, they pay no company tax on any of their 400 products that they make. And the church owned 22 food industries worldwide, making over 2,500 fake meats, soy milks and cereals. You know, just even from a biochemistry perspective, how can anybody even justify eating that stuff? You know, it's just not food. When you look at what's in it, it's just a whole bunch of chemicals, synthetic vitamins and minerals added in and any heaven knows what kind of combinations. Mm -hmm. I mean, it doesn't even represent food. And yet the labels are beautiful packaging and... I just find it really unbelievable. Well, this whole health star rating as well, mm. uh, just in the last couple of years, I've come to realise with the health star ratings, the expert technical advisor for our health star ratings to determine what gets the tick and what doesn't and you know how many stars they can get and how many stars they can't, Greg Gamble is the technical expert advisor for Sanitarium. <laughs> and he was the chief technical advisor on the health star ratings, you know, they're at every level of working out what the public will perceive as being healthy. Well, I find the meat, I find the progression of the meat, the anti-meat interesting because we started off with the cholesterol. No, we started with masturbation. Well, we started with masturbation, but then, you know, cholesterol was a reason not to eat meat. Mm -hmm. Saturated fat was a reason not to eat meat. And then that was disproved. You know, there's no evidence for that. 
So then we went on to meat causes cancer, kidney stone, you know, kidney disease. Diabetes, type 2 diabetes. Yeah. And so that's that myth, those myths have been now put to bed fairly clearly. And so what's left? We've got animal welfare and we've got, well, if you eat meat, you don't care about the environment. If you eat the meat, you don't care about animals. They've taken the messaging from personal responsibility about our health to a personal responsibility about the planet. And that's a really, really tough thing to challenge because they've got so many people believing that this is harming the planet. And I'm, I'd be lying if I didn't say I was a bit scared about how much power they've got over this. But if we truly go back to the biochemistry, if we think about the essential fatty acids, the essential vitamins and minerals, essential proteins, there's no indication for us to consume carbohydrates. We can eat non-essential non-essential carbohydrates, but our body can make all the glucose we need if we don't eat it. Outside the body, nutrition science is cultural, ethical, religious, and vested interests. And when the religious has a vested interest because they own food companies <laughs> and they are partnering with Coca-Cola, Coca-Cola, the vice president of Coca-Cola in 1978, when all this saturated fat was being demonized, the vice president for Coca-Cola founded the International Life Sciences Institute, ILSI which brought together at that time 400 food, pharmaceutical and chemical companies, including you know, Monsanto and Bayer. Like, this has provided an umbrella. They've been going for so long now, 50 years, that it's almost impossible, even if you challenge it, it's just water off a duck's back. You know, we provide research. We've got the specialists. We've got these people. Sanitarium was one of the founding members of Ilse Australia. Of who Australia? Ilse Australia. Mm. With Coca-Cola. And you know, this, when you look at the research, I, I can't tell people enough because I've spent the last seven years just absolutely <laughs> immersed in it. I can hear your frustration and your that there's hardly any research or any anything that doesn't have some sort of vested interest or religious ideology backing it or ideology I should say because there are some very strong um, proponents of a vegan diet because of animal welfare as well so but looking back over that 157 years it's all merging mm. and yeah I could go on for hours but your people might be going whoa what's this woman up we're getting very intense and excited about it all I think for the public they buy into the animal welfare environment concern and, and so do I. I I hate to see animals mistreated well, I think we need to do everything better we need to do it. human health better we need to do animals better and we need to do the environment better and mm -hmm. they're not separate from each other exactly so I think we need to do all of them better. But I can understand that people buy into those messages. Mm -hmm. And then isn't it so easy to go to the grocery shop and grab all these packets off the shelf? Everything's pre-prepared, ready-made. The packaging is beautiful. It tells you that it's got all the fiber and all the nutrients yeah. you need. And you just go home and put it together and feel like you're you know, living a healthy, a healthy lifestyle. And I think we're disconnected from our food supply. But I think, you know, one of the things, one of the most significant pieces of evidence we have against that approach is how our obesity, chronic disease, diabetes has exploded over my lifetime, the last 50 years. So we've had the biggest experiment ever, because it's been a worldwide experiment with the adoption of all these dietary guidelines, all Western countries have some version of the same thing. And the push 
them the got the worse the problem has got so I don't know if you can get a much bigger epidemiological study than that and I think this point about being disconnected from a uh, food supply is really really important for people to consider in New Zealand in Tasmania where we are we've got access to beautiful fresh seasonal local foods we've got right in front of me now I've got cattle grazing um, you know on pasture they're, they're not getting any supplemental water because the rain comes they've got a river right near like they've just they don't need it so this whole concept of you need this much water for cows you only need it if they're in a feedlot you don't need it out in nature but we're also completely disconnected by buying this packaged food thinking it's healthy and not considering the packaging the processing the transportation of all of these things and how much of an environmental cost they are mm. like if you go back and and can go to your local markets and buy fresh food from them you're saving so much environmentally and yeah so how do we change this connection potentially in tassie and in new zealand we can make a big impact by changing that i mean i love new zealand i've been four times now one of my favorite places in the world but you go to somewhere like New York that's just high rise and they don't have, they can't see grass <laughs> like we can, like that city, that they big park, but they don't have animals just grazing locally. A lot of people wouldn't see those things. Certainly in Germany now, they're all tucked away. Gary and I drove the entire length of Germany, did not see an animal. Oh, yeah. And that's scary. Mm, that's so, it. you know. We've, we've got to change this perception as well, especially to young people who are buying into this animal messaging, that animals are actually part of the solution. Well, we've got, we're getting introduced into our school curriculum, you know, meatless, you know, meatless days. And, you know, I don't want to get into any kind of political debate here, yeah. but, but, you know, we had a leaders debate um, you know, prior to our election, and both leaders talked about reducing our meat intake to reduce our, you know, carbon footprint and so on. And it comes from such a ill-informed place. Yeah. Um, but at the moment, those political statements are prominent and they probably think they'll win votes. Yeah. And as you say, it's, it's not about health. And we have to just, we have to look at this really differently. But the powers that be, and I'm talking serious, the vested interests and ideology do not want this messaging out there. They're prepared to spend years silencing an orthopedic surgeon in Tasmania, silencing yeah. Tim Noakes in South Africa, silencing an adulquist in um, Sweden. Like, this is a very important thing for them to do. When it's and without taking away anything from the work you're doing, when it's a health coach, when it's a nutritionist, when it's someone at the public, okay, well, we can discard those people in some ways. But once it becomes a doctor who's stating, who, who prescribes medication and who does these things, saying, actually, no, we can de-prescribe, we can change things by changing the food, they become massive targets to the people who are trying to protect guidelines. And, and now I, that I've seen it with my own eyes, it's just unbelievable what, what lengths they'll go to to silence that message. Yeah, and that's such an important point, like the lengths that they will go to to silence that message. Mm -hmm. You know, as you say, Gary's working, you know, he was working as an orthopaedic surgeon and... Improving his, health. <laughs> yeah, on, on a one-on-one -on -one individualised basis. Now... I mean, it's backfired because now we have, you know, Professor Noakes, we've got you and Gary out there, you're all over the world, you're all over the internet. So it's actually backfired because you're able to discredit that message now. And I think they had no idea. Like, I honestly believe they thought, oh, this is a little backwater. We'll just shut this doctor down. They had no idea his wife was <laughs> came out of nowhere because um, I, really, I was really very quiet in my past life. I said to someone the other day, I sort of always stayed in the background. I'm a professional photographer. 
So I even stayed out of focus behind the lens. I was telling other people's stories. And it wasn't until Gary got bullied and mobbed and then reported and investigated, I didn't just stand behind him or beside him without thinking. Mm. I stood in front of him. Mm. And I and I can't even explain why, but it was just this primitive response. They're just picking on my husband who's fought cancer, he's fought this, he's had a hip replacement, and now they're coming after him for improving people's health. I just went, this is it. You've crossed the line with me. I'm standing in front of him. And I didn't think about the fact that I've used my voice to give him back his. Mm. And I hope that conversations like this, that you and I are using our voices to give other people back their voice, mm. to allow them an opportunity to question and challenge guidelines or just to just go, this is actually making me better. Mm. So I'm going to keep doing this. Um, and that's great. And I'm right behind you. I'll be push it. I'll be supporting you all the way. And <laughs> everyone else out there in the space, it's just too valuable a message. Mm. So important. And along with the sugar message for me, the vegetable oils is another message that I'm really working hard to get promoted as well because it's really it's really the processed food it's really that combination mm. of processing that wheat adding some sugar adding some vegetable oils and we're creating this toxic mix that we're all consuming thinking that we're feeding ourselves in a healthy well, way gary's talk the nutritional model of modern disease is is exactly that it's uh, sugar uh, makes you hungry carbs make you fat and polyunsaturated oils make you sick because oh, if you consider, I've seen that one. I have to look that one out and make sure mm. I get it up on my website. Mm. Yeah, that's a really good one. And as you said, if we eat to a fresh seasonal, but it's also about the latitude that you're in. Yes. And when you consider a lot of islander people, they were quite big because they've got access to a lot of sugar, a lot of fruits. Like they're tropical, they're eating a lot, but they didn't have the plain saturated oils. And then you've got the Eskimos who ate a lot of fat, yes. but no polyunsaturated oils. It's when you combine these things together. Mm. You combine the sugar, the carbs, and the processed oils, the processing. Yes. But I think all of those things, Gary talks very specifically about what polyunsaturated oils do in rusting cells and different things. So I won't go into it properly because I don't know enough about the science. I've my specialty is uh, research into the vested interests and ideology shaping our guidelines. But I just know that's a really important part, that, a really important message that you're suggesting. I'll make sure I um, look that, look that um, talk up. I talked to Dr. Chris Kenobi a while ago as well. You, are you aware of Chris? Yeah, yeah. So um, he's very passionate about that message as well. But yeah. I think raises a really important point and I won't keep you too much longer because we've been talking for an hour but um, about the blue zones and you know the the questions about yeah, the that was amazing this week yeah. Oh, yeah. and then I found a radio New Zealand interview from about 12 months ago with the researcher that had presented that so I've, I've posted that online as well Excellent. well I'll grab that as well yeah, mm. I'll send I'll send you a link to it. <coughs> um, yeah, so that was so that was very interesting because that's something else that's always been used to support you know this whole plant based message. So can I just say, embarrassingly, Gary when he first started talking in two thousand and twelve two thousand and thirteen got me to make him a slide about the blue zone. <laughs> So I said to him, oh, my God. So I made him because he wanted to really focus on lifestyle, you know, sleep, community, all these other things. He didn't understand how plant-based it was because he thought Blue Zones, Mediterranean, they're eating meat. So he, he just, you know, it just sounded good, the Blue Zones. Anyway, very, very funny. So I made a slide about the Blue Zones. I've since deleted it. But, hey, but isn't that what this is all about? Isn't science about having a hypothesis, testing your hypothesis, re-evaluating, creating a new hypothesis. Absolutely. It's not about having 
this is a fact and regardless of any other input I'm going to refuse to change my mind I mean I don't know how many times in my life I change I change my mind all the time it's about learning and debating it and it can be quite a fiery debate sometimes with someone but if you're open to that debate and you really listen to the other person's point of view and it might even be that you go oh it couldn't possibly be true I mean Gary he said how can a lawyer know more about sugar than I do I'm a doctor and then he went wait a minute Mm." (laughs) I'll I'll reduce sugar and see what it does and so it's and the other thing that's really important which I think a lot of people underestimate for health professionals that have been indoctrinated that have been educated by vested interests and ideology to admit that you're wrong is a really big thing so not only do they have to admit it to themselves, but to admit it to the patients. And you know, if this has been 30 years of practice, say, or 25 years of practice, if you were wrong, you also have to consider how much harm you've done. And I don't believe that uh, like the magnitude of type 2 diabetes, the harm that's being done by the recommendations in this high um, carbohydrate, low fat, dietary recommendations and then people going on to insulin and medication for the rest of their life has created so much harm. It hasn't really been since thalidomide that we've had so many people lose limbs. Mm. Thalidomide occurred over a period of time. Some of the doctors committed suicide because they could not believe they prescribed harm. So a lot of the health professionals that are band-aiding sick care and stuck in this thing They've actually got to come to terms with the fact they might have prescribed harm. They need to be supported. We need to work out how we can go through all those stages of grief so that they can support themselves and their patients moving forward. And a lot of people just go, oh, why why don't you just change? Why don't you just do this? You've got to have someone like Gary and Tim and a few of them, like Tim just ripped up his entire textbook that he wrote on (laughs) eating for sport. I mean, massive. But a lot of people are really challenged. And in fairness, I understand that. You know, how hard would it be to think, my gosh, I prescribed that insulin for 20 years to someone that didn't need it and they've lost their eyesight or they've lost it. It's a big thing. So we need to be supportive also. We need to ask questions. We need to show this is my health. Look what I'm doing. Like David Unwin didn't have specific health issues. He's just won massive awards in the UK for being Doctor of the Year, NHS award for deprescribing, saving the community, but improving health outcomes. Most people in this space have been on their own health journey and have come to it from there. David Unwin and Eric Westman, another doctor, they listen to their patients. And then they must have had to go through that grieving and had to go through that whole process to then go, you know, I can't ignore this and I'm moving forward. So that's another thing I think is... I I agree. I mean, I think you're raising some really valid points there, but I think intellectual curiosity must play a role in that. It must. must. Yeah. It's got to be. It must play a role. Gary says, once you see the health benefits of LCHF, keto, fasting whatever you want to do you can never unsee it and it and it it doesn't sit right not to then support it yeah yeah um our chat today talking about the cancer you know so many cancer patients say oh i asked my doctor about this and they just go no nutrition's got nothing to do with it and you know you just want to sort of scream but at the same token you don't want to blame people you don't want to um, make them feel guilty at all because that's the last thing they need but to be offered an opportunity for solution has to be an adjunct an adjunct therapy and we need the doctors to recommend it Mm. Mm. because as you say why should it be responsibility of someone to go well I'm reducing sugar and your doctor go oh no don't do that like we need a doctors to have that as part of their toolkit this is an option you know it's another 
thing that we can maybe improve. And if you can't do it, it's okay. It's not a bad thing. But if you can, it could improve your health outcomes. You need to have give people more hope. And it's the one thing they can control. They can't control their chemo. They can't control radiotherapy. But, oh, if I cut the sugar out of my diet, it's something I can actually do for myself in this process of moving forward. And I think that's that gives people hope. I think that's a really fabulous message. Is there anything else about, um, you know, what we've been talking about today? Is there anything else you want to mention? Because what... Before we started and we spoke, you there was another topic you wanted to have a few words about. So I can that so much now I can't remember. What was it? About the, um, Gary asked about speaking about the paedophile at the um, oh, the no, issue no, and, I don't think all of that. No. I, I just think okay. I think it's really no, I was just mentioning that more as it's hard when you Again, when you're a health coach and you're talking about health and you're talking about people changing their diet and doing exercise and all of those other things, and then to have someone come in and challenge where the messaging has been coming from, I think it's quite confronting. And when I took over Gary's Facebook page, because he was just talking about the science, people were going to his page to listen to the science. Suddenly he was silenced. Along comes this girl who goes, well, actually, sorry, I can't talk about the science anymore. Well, I'll try and share things from other people, but I can't answer scientific questions. But by the way, I'm going to break through. <laughs> I can tell you about the vested interest in the ideology. I lost a lot of people who were following the page because they were there for the science. And I think that's more what I was trying to say is thank you for allowing me to yeah. give this information to your people who are listening because it's not what they've come to listen to you for necessarily but it's a really important part of understanding where the plant bias messaging is coming from, where this shaping of our dietary guidelines and, and this belief that animal proteins, well, animal fats certainly, and now animal proteins are harming us. If we don't understand the background, we can't question it. We can't go, well, that makes no sense. You, you start to fall into that behaviour. And I think what I was alluding to more was challenging people who are following you for some specific messaging because you do you become a you become a person who they rely on like now the people who follow me on Facebook are wanting me to go oh you were the blue zones you won't believe it or the seven countries study but actually if you put 192 in it makes no correlation at all to saturated fat so they're following me for that and just to, you can start to introduce something else but I think, you know, it's fantastic if you've got a group of people who are following you and passionate about supporting you and they'll take that message. They'll take it beyond your, your it's, it's paying it forward. And it's fantastic. And I agree with you. I think your message is really important about where all this came from and to give some context and some background because otherwise we just end up with a whole bunch of different people arguing <laughs> it sounds like we're just arguing points of view and it's like well who do we but what point of view do we believe you know and well this is more on the media than that is and you know we've got global warming stuff and you know why would I believe what you're telling me so I think having the content text for this is super important people like Zoe um, Harkham are really important as well because she puts it in such a fantastic context and she's just so good on the evidence and she dissects the data she's so well informed and she's so, mm. oh, and she's so honest too like she doesn't she's not just about presenting one point of view she's so fair in her dissection of that data and yes. I think that's a really important context to put the conversation in. So your work is superbly um, important for the whole process. It's highly so referenced. thank you so much for that. If you want to go to my website, it's, everything's yeah. highly referenced. I have not put up anything that I wasn't able to find at some stage on the internet. Certainly some things have been taken down. I, I'd screen, grab them and everything else, but nothing I've spoken about isn't there, and especially in regards to the um, Seventh-day Adventist, if you just do Seventh-day Adventist lifestyle medicine, like you'll actually bring up 
specific articles that they've put into their magazines and online about how important it is to push this lifestyle medicine um, agenda. And finding that they founded on the campus of Loma Linda University, I needed to use other methods, but you know, a lot of it is just there. And, and they are super proud of what they're achieving. And they believe they're changing lives. They believe they're making it a better place because that's their teaching. So again, it's really hard for the individuals to be challenged. Imagine having such a strong belief and having someone like me going, well, actually, you're creating harm. Again, I just, it was a really hard place to step into. And it was only that Gary said to me, in the two years you've been doing this research, I've gone from seeing one person a week to two to three people a week. We have to explain why healing requires animal proteins. We have to explain where this plant bias method is coming from because my patients are being harmed. Well, you're a very courageous lady and you're a very courageous couple. So yeah. it's fantastic. We're very so, noisy. <laughs> And noisy, so that's good. I like noisy. Mm -hmm. So whereabouts can people find you? You've got isupportgary.com. Isupportgary.com. I don't do lots on there, but when I write, there's they're long, so just warn people. Um, probably a really good article, if you want to really go back into the history, is an article I wrote saying lifestyle medicine, where did the meat go? Um, and that goes all the way back to the temperance movements that I believe started cereals and sugar so you know the health temperance reform ideas moved towards the um, cereal industry and prohibition of alcohol actually allowed the sugar industry to flourish which is interesting because the american bar instead of being alcohol became the ice cream parlor mm. so you know, if you want to really dig back to where this whole collaborations come from that's a it's long but it goes right back Others I've just touched on and I'm going to try and start doing some shorter ones because even I can't remember where I've tucked things sometimes. But, yeah, I've got the website. Um, I'm active on LinkedIn. Uh, I do a bit on Instagram, not a lot, but a little bit because I just think all of these platforms have different groups of people. Probably my Facebook page that I took over from Gary, Belinda Fecky, No Fructose which doesn't make any sense to what I'm talking about, but that's, he called it Gary Fecchino Fructose. And when we had him science, we just put a big line through it and said, all into Fecchino Fructose, had a million views when I told everyone that he was silenced and why. So I've kept the name because it's just what people are used to, but I've got a, a big following there and a lot of interaction. Interestingly, the algorithms have changed massively, whereas I used to get 100,000 people seeing nearly every post I did maybe 10 to 20,000 now. And I truly believe that's algorithms because the people who are following me are still really invested in my what I'm talking about. Same amount of likes, but you know, things, yeah. but I'm there. And um, yeah, <laughs> oh, it's on Twitter. I'm, I'm very noisy on Twitter. Great. I don't think I've seen you on Twitter. I don't use Twitter very much. I find <laughs> having LinkedIn and Facebook is quite overwhelming enough for my it's technology big. skills. It's actually and, big. And it takes so much time yeah. to be involved in those because it's not only being involved, as you would know, then you get people messaging you, asking you for advice and questions and sending you things. Well, they send me some amazing things too because I get some of my information, but it's a very huge commitment to be this involved when I get paid nothing. Yeah. I've done all of this for nothing. Like I don't have a business, I don't have a consult. Someone did ask to come and see me as a dietitian. I went, oh, <laughs> no. Um, you know, it's a big commitment when you've got family and but yeah. I've done it to clear Gary's name and say to give other people a voice. And it's been a fantastic job of work. I think I said that the right way around. <laughs> And also people can find you on YouTube as well. Um, there have been many other interviews and you've put out some podcasts um, so people can find you on YouTube. So we'll kind of link to all of that on our on my website and all in our show notes so that people can go and find you and follow you and ask you some more Susan, <laughs> Ask more questions. I've oh, got a lot to say. <laughs> oh, it's fantastic. And it's been such a great summary of this whole 
um, issue and the context. I, I know you fitted this in, in a very busy schedule, so I really appreciate it. Thanks so much.